Welcome to this presentation of Mountain Men. Three became leading citizens of Santa Barbara and seen through vintage postcards and photographs. My name is George Sampanis, and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara's past. In part one, A Breed Apart, we delved into the adventures and explorations of several mountain men who touched and influenced the lives of Lewis Burton, Isaac Sparks, and George Nidever. In part two, Santa Barbara Citizens, we will explore the lives of the three men and their adventures as they made their way through the wilderness across the continent arriving in Santa Barbara to become leading citizens. Lewis Burton, Isaac Sparks, and George Nidever were three mountain men who came across the country to California in the 1830s as part of separate fur trapping expeditions. Burton with the William Wolfskill Party, 1831, Sparks, with the Ewing Young Party, 1832, and Nidever with the Captain Joseph R. Walker Party in 1833. Throughout this presentation, mention of one of these men often involves either one or both of the others. Just as their lives contain many similarities, their paths often crossed and intersected. All three were born between 1799 and 1805. Burton and Nidever were born in Tennessee. Each had encounters with Indians and grizzly bears. Each hunted with George Yunt in California. They all became expert seamen, and they all hunted sea otter under license of William Dana. Each married Santa Barbara women with connections. They all lived on Burton Mound at one time or another. Each became a successful merchant. Each was involved with the lone woman of San Nicolas Island. Each invested in the Chapala Street Wharf. Each was involved with General Fremont and each became leading citizens of Santa Barbara. While the focus of this presentation is on Burton, Sparks, and Nidever, they were not the first mountain men to visit California. The first was James O. Patty, who we discussed in part one. He arrived here in 1830, one year before Burton. He came early that year to quote, vaccinate people from smallpox, which was raging in California. Patty had been imprisoned for some time in San Diego for not having a passport. He received a release on the condition that he travel up the coast, mission by mission, inoculating residents with a vaccine he had in his possession. He was the first American mountain man local Santa Barbarans had ever seen. His appearance in a fur cap, fringed buckskin clothes, and long rifle, along with the rough and ready manner, drew much interest from the locals, especially in contrast to the more cultivated visitors from New England who had come by sea. But in the next year or two, the novelty of seeing a mountain man wore off. What our mountain men saw when they came to Santa Barbara in the 1830s was a village surrounded by 60 to 80 single story whitewashed adobe houses with painted balconies and verandas, each with a little garden. The population was about 750. Lewis T. Burton, was the first of our mountain men to arrive in Santa Barbara. Born in Tennessee in 1809, he
He came to Santa Barbara when he was 21 years old, along with George Yunt. Both were part of the 11-man Wolfskill Party of 1830. The party left Taos, New Mexico, taking a more northerly route from the old Spanish Trail. In the Wasatch Range, they encountered freezing temperatures and heavy snow as the men suffered from the cold and hunger. Wolfskill attempted to head south to the Spanish Trail, but deep winter snows blocked their efforts. A howling blizzard brought all movement to an end. George Yunt graphically wrote about their experience in the penetrating mountain chill and utter isolation of the 11 men. He said, our trappers with much toil reached a strip of tableland upon a lofty range of mountains where we encountered the most terrible snowstorm we had ever experienced. During the next several days, no one ventured out of camp. There they lay embedded in very deep snow. Animals and men huddled together to obtain all possible warmth. They spread their thick and heavy blankets and piled bark and brushwood around and over them. A small stream of water ran directly through a corner of their camp and they used it for themselves and their animals. A blazing fire was kept burning night and day in the center. With their beaver skins, they were enabled to cover themselves and provide a comfortable bed. Thus, they lay shut out from the world while the storm was howling around them and the snow falling in astonishing profusion. The snowstorm finally ended, then turned to rain for several hours, and then followed by piercing cold, forming a strong crust of ice on the surface of the snow, which would bear the weight of the heaviest of the animals. After the storm subsided and the weather had softened, Wolfskill and Yunt ascended a lofty peak of the mountains for observation. Yunt stated, in the whole range the human eye could see in every direction, nothing could be discerned, but only mountains piled on mountains, all capped with cheerless snow in a long and continuous succession till they seemed to mingle with the blue vault of heaven and fade away in the distance. It was a cheerless prospect and calculated to cause emotions by no means agreeable in the stoutest heart." End quote. The descent from the frozen snow-covered heights of the Wasatch Plateau to the valley of the Virgin River was a nightmare of cold, trackless mountains, impenetrable snowdrifts, and slipping and sliding horses. But the hardships at last ended in a pleasant valley filled with herds of elk, deer, and antelope, foraging virtually unmolested by man and almost as tame as the sheep and goats of a farmer's barnyard. Once they arrived in California, is it any wonder that Wilskill, Yunt, and Burton all decided to stay? Soon after arriving in California, George Yunt was invited by William Dana, a naturalized ship captain from Boston, and now captain of the port of Santa Barbara, to hunt the lucrative sea otter under his license. For one half the proceeds, Dana would furnish provisions, canoes, and transportation to the islands or coast. Yunt with his helpers, would retrieve the other half. His first haul from the island netted him $2,000 for 75 furs. Burton and Sparks formed a partnership also hunting the prized sea otter under Dana's license. 
Soon, Nidever joined in, and over the next 10 years, under various arrangements, Burton and Sparks, Sparks and Nidever, or each alone with their own employees, hunted the sea otter primarily around the Channel Islands and as far north as Monterey. Sea otter hunting was a hazardous occupation. The fast-moving mammals lived in the kelp beds, and it was necessary to pursue them in small boats and to catch them quickly, for when pursued or wounded, they would dive deeply and escape. Burton, Sparks, and Nidever all became proficient at the dangerous work. Once established, they hired Kanakas, or Mission Indians, to maneuver small boats with astonishing skill and daring and to paddle and swim out and retrieve the catch. In October 1834 in Monterey, Isaac J. Sparks chartered the newly built 22-ton schooner Pior es Nada, meaning worse than nothing, and sailed south for otter hunting. Burton joined Sparks on the voyage and may have sailed with Sparks on the 1835 voyage when the Nicolaño Indians were taken from San Nicolas Island and brought to San Pedro. All but the famous lone women, that is. A few years after Burton's arrival in Santa Barbara, he was almost killed by robbers near present-day Avila Beach. He escaped and was nursed back to health by the ladies of the Carrillo family. Soon after, in 1839, he married Maria Antonia Carrillo, whose sister was married to William Dana, whose license, a trio of mountain men, were to contract with. In order to marry and obtain property, one had to convert to Catholicism and become a naturalized Mexican citizen. He did just that, obtaining Mexican citizenship in 1842. After only four years of marriage, she died in 1843. Five years later, after her death, he married her cousin, Maria Carrillo E. Ortega, who died three years later. With his earnings from his otter trade and his inherited wealth, he purchased Rancho Bolsa, a 14,000-acre Mexican land grant in present-day San Luis Obispo County, bordered on the north by Rancho Pismo and on the south by Rancho Guadalupe, and then purchased another grant that is present-day Vandenberg Air Force Base. Burton had become one of the wealthiest American-born citizens in Santa Barbara. He was one of six men who welcomed John C. Fremont with his troops after crossing the Santa Inez Mountains on December 24, 1846. He was less than pleased when drafted into Fremont's battalion for his sharpshooting skills. In 1850, Lewis Burton became the first Santa Barbara assessor, valuing city property at $993,000. The council then appointed him Santa Barbara's first mayor. The minutes of the Common Council first meeting recorded Burton's election. Quote, In the city of Santa Barbara on the 26th of August, 1850, the persons elected to the Common Council assembled and proceeded to elect the president. Lewis T. Burton, having received the majority of the votes, was declared and elected. In 1860, he purchased the adobe built on what was to be later known as Burton Mound. The mound had been inhabited by Indians for thousands of years but abandoned by 1805. It was about two acres, shaped like an inverted saucer, 
about 30 feet high, surrounded by a tidal marsh. That property was another area of commonality among the three men. Isaac Sparks, the first of the three to own the property, bought it in 1840. One year later, he sold it to George Nidever, who lived there for five years. Burton purchased the property in 1860. The house was 120 feet by 40 feet. Rooms were 20 by 20. The parlor, 30 feet long with thick walls, keeping things warm in winter and cool in summer. Served as a post office and general store and residence. The five acre property had a vegetable garden and an orchard with pear, peach, fig, and olive trees. In his declining years, Burton could be found sitting in his garden telling tales of his adventures as a mountain man and a sea otter hunter. Burton died in 1879, living a full life as a mountain man, sea otter hunter, rancher, patriot, merchant, farmer, civic leader, and one of the shareholders in the company that built the short-lived Chapala Street Wharf. Isaac J. Sparks was born in 1800 in Baldwin, Maine. Following the death of his mother, he and his father left Maine for Ohio and eventually found their way to St. Louis, where his father found employment as a representative of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. During the next eight years, Isaac attended school studying medicine. Years later, and half a continent away in Santa Barbara, he received his license to practice. In 1830, his father died and he took a job with the company. A few months later, in April 1831, he joined a fur trading expedition led by the famous mountain man, Jedediah Smith. It was Sparks's first expedition and Smith's last. Sparks trapped beaver, hunted buffalo, and fought in continuing battles with hostile Indians. In one incident, a trapper named Minturn, out hunting antelope for the Smith party, was brutally killed by a band of Pawnee. Paraphrasing Mrs. F. H. Day in an article published in the Hesperian in 1859. To extract revenge, they took the clothes from a trapper who had recovered from smallpox and laid them across an old pack horse, secured them, and then drove him towards the Pawnee settlement. The tribe appropriated the clothing whereupon they became infected with the disease. Sleep on in peace, young Minturn, for thy death has been fearfully and terribly avenged." End quote. After continuous assaults by the Indians, Sparks and the rest of the Smith party experienced severe gales of wind that went on for day after day, blowing sand such that all trace of a trail was lost and all one could see was trackless wastes of sand. Out of water and suffering from near starvation, the trappers had to eat their horses to survive. Jedediah Smith, undaunted, went out in search of water where he was set upon by a party of Comanches and killed. After finally finding water and surviving several additional attacks, Isaac Sparks and the remaining Smith party reached Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, Sparks joined with the group under Ewing Young's leadership, heading to the Colorado to trap. The expedition proved to be besieged by hunger, Indian attacks, and a defect in the mechanism of the trap 
which allowed the beaver to escape. The disappointed party made their way back to Santa Fe. In New Mexico, Ewing Young started on his second expedition to the Pacific with 12 men, Sparks included, as they set out across the Colorado desert for the coast. Once again, they were attacked by Indians in a prolonged battle resulting in 14 natives being killed. Sparks and the young party reached Los Angeles in the spring of 1832. However, the Mexican government was not so fond of Americans in their territory without passports. While separated from the rest of the party and attending the leg injury of another trapper, Sparks was arrested and jailed. After a few days, he was able to escape the jail, regain his rifle, and make his way to San Pedro via the Los Angeles River. He lived near the ocean and engaged in sea otter hunting. None of the hunters worked from the bottom up more truly than Isaac Sparks. When he began in 1832, his rifle was his only capital. Shooting from the shore, he himself would swim out to secure the prize and return to his rifle. He soon was able to hire a swimmer. In 1834, Sparks moved to Santa Barbara and teamed up with Burton hunting under the Dana license. As mentioned earlier, they chartered the newly built Pioras Nada from which they hunted the otter with limited success. The following year, Sparks skippered the schooner that ferried the remaining Indians from San Nicolas Island to the mainland, all but one. In 1836, Sparks purchased the adobe we had discussed earlier on what was later to be called Burton Mound. While he was away hunting sea otter for long periods of time, he did find time to become a prominent merchant with a store on the northwest corner of State and Canon Perdido. 1836 was a banner year for Sparks marrying Maria Ayers. Together, they had seven children. She was the daughter of sea captain George Washington Ayers and his Polynesian mistress. Captain Ayers, you may recall, had his ship, the Mercury, carried up Refugio Canyon by a tidal wave triggered by the devastating earthquake of 1812, and then carried back to the sea without damaging the vessel. When in his late 30s, he came close to death, losing his right eye to a grizzly bear. One account has the attack taking place in the Santa Barbara foothills and marrying Maria Ayers, the young woman who nursed him back to health. Another account claims the injury to Sparks' eye was inflicted by a bear while en route from New Mexico to California during the Ewing Young expedition. Both accounts claim him to be the only man to kill a grizzly bear by hand. In 1837, Sparks became a naturalized Mexican citizen and a Catholic, allowing him to expand his real estate holdings, acquiring the 22,000-acre Juzuana Grant in San Luis Obispo County, and later the Pismo Grant of 8,900 acres. In 1846, Sparks, accompanied by Burton, Nidever, and Nicholas Den, rode out to the foothills north of present-day Patterson Avenue to greet Lieutenant Colonel John C. Fremont, paraphrasing George Nidever. Quote, I asked Sparks if he would join Fremont. 
He refused, saying he was a Mexican citizen and could not do it. Conveying the answer to Fremont, he said nothing, but was very displeased. I overheard some men discussing raising Sparks' home and confiscating his stock. I lost no time in appraising Sparks of their intentions, and he at once went to tell Fremont that he would join him. Sparks was conscripted as a rifleman by Fremont, and $900 worth of supplies were requisitioned from his store. In 1849, Sparks and Nidever, with others in their employ, were hunting otter near San Francisco when they received word of the discovery of gold. They proceeded up the Feather River and mined a rich claim yielding 15 ounces a day. However, the party was struck with fever, affecting all. Nidever reco recovered quickly, but several of their party died. With Sparks still ill, they decided to take passage and return to Santa Barbara. In 1853, Sparks became Santa Barbara's fourth mayor, and in 1854, he built the first two-story brick house in Santa Barbara, located on the southwest side of State Street between Gutierrez and Montecito Streets which later became the Park Hotel. In 1865, he was one of the stockholders of the Santa Barbara Wharf Company, which built Santa Barbara's first wharf at the end of Chapala Street. Sparks died before the wharf was completed. This ill-fated venture was superseded by Stern's Wharf in 1872. Isaac Sparks died on June 16, 1867. He was buried in the old Montecito Street graveyard, and 10 years later, his remains were reinterred into the newly created Santa Barbara Cemetery. George Nidever was born in 1802 in Tennessee, one of nine children. He was the third with five brothers and three sisters. The family moved to North Carolina when he was five. At age eight, he began to use firearms, hunting and shooting targets and working on the farm. He soon became a crack shot at annual shooting matches, having but few equals. When he was 18, a group of seven families started through the wilderness of Arkansas. He and his brother Jacob accompanied them. They brought along a few cattle to sell and intended to return for their family if they found the country good. The three-month journey was successful for the brothers as they sold their stock and settled down to farm near Fort Smith, Arkansas, where the family joined them. After six years seeking adventure, George and Alex Sinclair, a neighbor, decided to take to hunting and trapping. In 1830, Nye Dever, his other brother Mark, and Sinclair joined a party of want-to-be trappers and hunters, led by an inexperienced former gunsmith, Colonel Bean. Of the 48 men in the party, Nye Dever, Sinclair, and another were the only ones who had fought Indians. Because of his skills and reputation as being a successful hunter, Nidever, along with two others, were given responsibility of supplying the camp with meat. He was appointed chief hunter after consistently returning from the hunt with three times the kills as the other two. After crossing the Arkansas River, a party of 80 Pawnee Indians came out of the woods making signs of friendship. Most of the trapper party did not trust them. Against the approval of most of the party, Colonel Bean gave them presents of blankets, tobacco, and even knives and powder. 
as the Bean Party set up camp, the Pawnee did the same camping 60 yards away. The evening passed without incident. The next day, Graham and Nidever, a few miles from camp, spotted buffalo. They dismounted and quietly approached. Suddenly, Nidever saw an Indian's head peeping out and realized they had been drawn into a trap. Two Comanche on horseback emerged from the woods and came after them. Following were another three dozen or so. Quoting Nidever, we ran and they followed us and being better mounted than we were, soon came within shooting distance. They discharged a shower of arrows, many going beyond us. We saw it was, use, it was useless to run any further, so we stood our ground. One rode close enough to throw a spear, which we easily dodged. Nidrever drew a bead on him and shot him dead. The Indians did a lot of yelling, but did not bother them anymore. A few days later, Nidever and Graham, while out in search of buffalo, about four miles from camp, were involved in an eerily similar situation. Again on foot, after tracking buffalo, they were spotted by a war party of 80 Arapaho, two of whom were mounted. The closest cover was a mile ahead as they ran for their lives. The two on horseback were gaining on them. They stopped, took aim, but unlike, unlike the previous encounter with the Comanche party, the two lead Arapaho had their horses jumping side to side to avoid being shot. When nearly upon them, Nidever saw the lead Indian on horseback purposefully throw down his gun just as Graham turned to shoot him. Fortunately, Nidever saw this and prevented Graham from shooting. Otherwise, they would have been toast. Captured, the Indians got their arms around Nidever and Graham, shaking them roughly and throwing them to the ground, then seated themselves in a circle around the captives, passing a pipe around, deciding what to do with them. After some time via sign language, they were able to convince the Arapaho warriors that a party of 80 armed white men were camped nearby and would extract revenge if they were harmed. The Arapaho made signs that Nidera and Graham were to lead them to the camp. With Nidera and Graham leading, the camp assumed them to be friendly. That evening, the Indians set up camp about 60 yards away. During the evening with the Arapaho camp nearby, several Pawnee were prowling around as one of the guards called out, who's that? A shower of arrows and some shots followed. Unable to see the attackers, the men fired back to where they saw the flashes originate. Having a small cannon with them, they loaded it with 60 bullets and discharged it in the direction of the Indians, which succeeded in silencing their fire. The camp spent the rest of the evening expecting their return, but morning came and the Pawnee had disappeared. The damage the camp received was seven horses stolen and several wounded. A frightened Colonel Bean hid during the assault, thereafter totally being disregarded by the trappers. They broke camp in the morning, as did the Arapaho. After a week's travel, a party of six that included Graham Nidever and his brother Mark, a man named Chris and two others, went ahead over the mountain to hunt for food for the party. They came upon a beautiful valley abundant with buffalo and deer, whereupon they skinned and hung their bounty out of the reach of coyotes and bears. 
Mark and Chris headed back to camp to inform the party of their success, while Nidever and Graham moved to higher ground with a view over the valley and their meat harvest, only to see a huge Arapaho war party stealing it. They headed back towards camp and discovered the dead bodies of both his brother Mark and Chris, scalped and stabbed in many places. The main party considered the area too dangerous and turned their trapping operations towards New Mexico. In New Mexico, they came upon a shepherd's hut with an old man and a boy. The old man, thinking them to be Arapahoes, ran for the hills. The Arapahoes and the Mexicans were deadly enemies. The boy came out of the hut, holding out his hand and showing great pleasure. This may have been the boy mentioned in Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem on Nidever. After selling their furs in Santa Fe, the main party split about half joining Ewing Young in his first expedition to California. The remaining group, including Nidever, trapped their way north on the way to the rendezvous at Pierre's Hole, arriving on July 4, 1832. As more trappers arrived, the numbers reached about 500. Leaving Pierre's Hole in August, along with two other parties, and while about 15 miles away, they were spotted by a horde of some 500 Blackfeet Indians intent on attacking them. A runner was dispatched back to Pierre's Hole for reinforcements. And attack they did. Nidever was now engaged in the battle of Pierre's Hole. The trappers held a Blackfeet in check until reinforcements arrived with seasoned trapper leader William Sublette in charge. He was wounded, as was Alex Sinclair, Nidever's longtime friend. Once surrounded, the Blackfeet refused to surrender, resulting in nearly all of them being annihilated. There are five eyewitness accounts to the Battle of Pierre's Hole. Warren Ferris, George Nidever, Joe Meek, Nathaniel Wyeth, and Zenith Leonard. Spending the next exceptionally cold winter trapping, Nidever, having heard stories of California, decided to seek a warmer climate. At the next rendezvous, he joined the Captain Walker party to search for an overland route to California. The Walker party was followed and harassed by Indians, gathering additional forces as they progressed. The Walker group detoured whenever they faced a narrow passage, thick woods, or other places favorable for an ambush. Coming upon a thick body of willows, they opted to make one such detour to the adjoining plain, likely saving the lives of many if not all of Walker's party. As soon as they left the trail, four to 500 Indians emerged from the thicket. Quoting Nidever, we halted and prepared for a fight. 34 Indians advanced in a body and 15 of our men, myself among the number, were ordered out to meet them. We allowed them to get quite close before opening fire. But when we did shoot, it was with such telling effect that but one escaped. This appeared to completely disenhearten our enemies for they permitted us to pass without further intervention. In June, 1834, the Walker party crossed the Sierra Nevada mountains. In November, having made their way to Gilroy for a month, they proceeded to Monterey. Nidever stayed in Monterey, where he met George Yunt, who invited Nidever to join him 
to hunt otter around the bay, meeting with moderate success. Nidever stayed in Monterey, where he met George Yunt, who invited Nidever to join him to hunt otter around San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento River. After two months, they returned, having met with moderate success. A few months later, Yunt received a contract from Alpheus B. Thompson of Santa Barbara for 20,000 shingles to build his home, the first in the Monterey style of architecture. He offered to hire Nidever, who informed Yunt he was not in the habit of working for wages, and he soon took passage on Alfred Robinson's California to Santa Barbara. Here, he met a former mountain man friend named Daniel Sills and agreed to hunt sea otter together on the islands. Given the impossibility of foreigners obtaining a license and learning that Isaac Sparks and Lewis Burton were hunting under the license of William Dana, Nidever and Sills made a similar arrangement. Our three beaver trapping landlubber mountain men were now being transformed into otter hunting seagoing skippers. Burton and Sparks had just come back from a hunt on the islands when Nidever and Sills were dropped off on Santa Rosa Island. Having no boat, they were forced to hunt from land. A few weeks later, Sills became ill, forcing his return to Santa Barbara. Nidever hired a Kanaka, a Hawaiian, whom he paid $16 a month to swim out and retrieve the otter after it was shot. During the next six weeks, he was able to kill 10 sea otter. Nidever was intrigued by a story Sparks would often tell concerning the lost woman of San Nicolas Island. The inhabitants of the remote island were most likely of the Tonga tribe, which also inhabited Catalina. Surely they were not Chumash. The tribe had been decimated by marauding Indians from the north, the Aleuts. For their safety, the Padres sent the ship to evacuate the remnants, which now numbered about 25, mostly women and children. Nidever, recalling what Sparks had told him of the event, stated, Having got all the Indians to the beach, one of the women went back for her child. A strong wind came up, and fearing safety for the ship, it put off. After unloading the passengers at San Pedro, the ship immediately was called away to San Francisco. The story of her abandonment was known up and down the coast, but through a series of unfortunate circumstances, she was forgotten and thought to have died from hunger. During the mid-1830s, George Nidever made Santa Rosa his winter headquarters living in this cave, the entrance pictured here. In addition to Nidever, Sparks, and Black Steward, an Irishman, a Portuguese, and an American, a cook, and five Kanakas made up the hunting group. Before continuing, let me tell you a little bit about Black Steward. In 1835, Alan B. Light arrived in Santa Barbara as a steward aboard the Pilgrim of two years before the mast fame, and thus became Santa Barbara's first American-born black citizen, and most likely adopting the name Black Steward. He most likely jumped ship and joined up with Nidever to hunt sea otters on the Channel Islands. Nidever described him as quite intelligent, well-behaved and mannered, and as a good hunter. They were very successful together, 
in one season alone getting 60 skins. Years later, Black Stewart was appointed game warden and was involved in a fight with the grizzly bear in Montecito. Being slashed to ribbons, he survived to kill the bear. In 1835, Alan B. Light arrived in Santa Barbara as a steward aboard the Pilgrim of two years before the mast fame and most likely jumped ship. He became Santa Barbara's first American-born black citizen, adopting the name Black Stewart. He joined up with Nidever to hunt sea otter on the Channel Islands. Nidever described him as quite intelligent, well-behaved and mannered, and a very good hunter. They were successful together, in one season alone, getting 60 skins. Years later, Black Steward was appointed game warden and was involved in a fight with the grizzly bear in Montecito. Being slashed to ribbons, he survived killing the bear. George Nidever, Isaac Sparks, and Black Steward successfully hunted sea otter under license from William Dana. Nidever received $30 per pelt which equates to over $500 per pelt in today's dollars. In the 1840s, the price of the valuable pelts had escalated to where they were retailing for over $4,000 per pelt in today's dollars. Nidever described an event in 1836 that would prove to be a turning point in coastal otter hunting. On the northeast side of the island, there is a large cave. Its entrance is hardly larger than an ordinary doorway, but the cave is so large inside that a hundred persons could occupy it with ease. Here, we kept our provisions and other supplies. Sparks, and some of our men saw a brig and remarked casually that they were perhaps Northwest Aleut Indians. Sparks and Black Steward, while hunting together before, had been driven up to the island by these Indians and their supplies captured. We had agreed to fight them at least as long as we could. He continues, one morning, a few days after sighting the brig, we were hunting off the head of Santa Rosa Island. It was foggy, and at about seven o'clock, we started an otter and began running it towards the head of the island. Black Steward was about a quarter of a mile from shore. I was nearly opposite him and distant about three or 400 yards farther out while Sparks was between us and a little to the rear. Just as we were rounding the point, Black Steward called out, here come the Northwest Indians. Sure enough, just ahead of us, coming out of the fog, were five or six canoes pulling with might and main to cut us off from the shore. Each canoe had two Indians and some of them a third. When Black Steward called to us, the foremost canoe was but a few hundred yards away and the other only a short distance in the rear. The fog had prevented us from discovering them while our shooting had indicated to them our exact position. At the first alarm, we made a straight line for the shore and our men needed no urging to exert themselves. We all made for a small cove or bay just below the point and lined with thick bushes. Black Steward was the first to reach the beach. Jumping out as soon as his boat grounded, he turned and fired on the foremost canoe. The ball fell short. A moment later, Sparks reached the shore and almost at the same time, 
I jumped onto the beach beside him amidst a shower of buckshot, the Indians having already opened fire. Sparks fired at the foremost canoe, wounding one of the Indians who fell, but raised again just in time to receive my shot, which settled him. This was a reception they little expected, and they turned back until a safe distance from us, exchanging shots with us in the meanwhile. The three men continued to shoot at the attackers, killing three and wounding up to five, causing the Indians to retreat to their ship. Nidever Sparks and Black Steward buried their supplies and canoes in the sand and waited. The following morning, the Aleut returned in their canoes. Nidever continues. They gradually approached the cave, passed by it as if without any intention of landing. There they stopped to fish in the kelp. We instructed Black Steward to remain and keep a lookout while we crept down to the point to get a shot at them if possible. We reached the point unseen and were about to fire when the men at the cave raised the cry that the Indians were landing. We ran back just in time. Just before we reached the cave, Black Stewart and O'Brien both fired at the two Indians in the first canoe, but missed them. Our shots brought down one of them, whereupon they turned and put off firing as they went. They again went off to the brig. The two days followed without any further attempt of the Indians to return. On the third day, they sailed away and we never saw them again. This event proved to be a turning point in coastal otter hunting as the Aleuts never returned. In 1841, Nidever purchased from Isaac Sparks the house an adjoining acreage and was later to be known as Burton Mound. It is highlighted here in green in a later image. That year, Nidever was baptized at the Santa Barbara Mission and a month later married Maria Simferosa Ramona Sanchez, whose family owned the 14,000 acre Rancho Santa Clara Ria del Norte in present-day Oxnard. She had grown up among the best of Santa Barbara's society. Together, they had six children and lived on Burton Mound for about 10 years until they sold the property to Lewis Burton. Nidever continued making his living fur trapping and skippering among the Channel Islands. In 1846, Nidever, having concluded a successful otter hunting trip up north, headed south and upon reaching Monterey, learned that the Americans had taken the town. He met John C. Fremont and promised to join him in Santa Barbara. Upon his return home, he was arrested by the Californians and learned from his wife that his home had been searched weapons seized, and the house ransacked. He was ordered to go and report to Los Angeles, but instead hid in the hills, first at Dos Pueblos and then in Montecito. Often, late in the evening, he would secretly return home to sleep. Once, he was spotted and reported to Captain Delaguerra, who dispatched a group of 12 men to apprehend him. One such evening, Nidever and his wife Maria were awakened from the noise as their home was being surrounded. He quickly hid in a secret space that was once an outside door long since covered. The space between the wall and the interior was wide enough to fit two or three people and was completely concealed by a large wooden cupboard. After a long delay, Maria opened the door and when asked where he was, 
She answered, Los Angeles. They made a thorough search of the house several times, including the rooms, baking ovens, trunks, boxes, and mattresses. Thereupon, they apologized and left. Three days later, Fremont arrived in Santa Barbara and Nideva wasted no time in seeking him out and telling him how he had been treated. Fremont ordered a lieutenant and several men to accompany Nideva in the search of homes for arms. Casa de la Guerra was the first place Nideva led them to. Standing on the porch were the captain, his son, and several others. Quoting Nideva, I addressed the captain saying, as they had searched my house to their heart's content, but a few days before, I had come to return the favor. Captain Fremont made the Alpheus B. Thompson home his headquarters. It later became the San Carlos Hotel. Nidever accompanied Fremont to Cahuenga, where the treaty ending the Mexican-American War was signed. In 1849, as previously mentioned, Nidever and Sparks had mined a rich claim yielding 15 ounces a day, but returned to Santa Barbara because of a feverish plague. Nidever organized another trip to the mines with Burton joining the party for a short time. They did considerable prospecting, working many claims, but none rich. Nidever left the gold camp and hunted deer for about a month, selling them for $400, more than he had made the whole season at mining. During the next few years, Nidever skippered his schooner about the Channel Islands, hunting the sea otter, gathering gull eggs, which were in great demand at the time, and piloting a U.S. government party surveying the islands. 1853 was a memorable year for Nidever. In February, he purchased a one-half interest of San Miguel Island. In September, he found the legendary lone woman that had been left on San Nicolas Island. And in December, he rescued some of the stranded passengers from the wreck of the Winfield Scott on Anacapa Island. Nidever built an adobe 400 feet about Kyla's Cove, and 10 years later, the stock numbered 6,000 sheep, 200 cattle, 100 hogs, and 30 horses before the 1863-64 drought decimated his stock. He owned the island for 17 years. Getting back to the lone woman, 18 years passed before she was found alive and in good health by Nidever. Her story begs to be told in detail, but not here. When found, she was willingly brought to the mainland to the Nidever's home where she became a celebrity. Santa Barbarans in awe brought food, clothing, and gifts to the woman who had survived all those years on the desolate, on the desolate island. Unfortunately, after 18 years of eating raw blubber, fish, and wild roots, and now feasting on cooked meat, fruits, and pastries, her digestive system could not handle the change. Seven months later, the lone woman of San Nicolas Island died in the Nidever home. When Nidever was 77 years old, he was visited by E.F. Murray, of the Bancroft Library sent to obtain his memoirs. Murray induced Nidever to shoot three shots at a paper target three inches square hanging on a nail 60 yards away. All three shots landed on the paper, the second shot hitting the nail. Nidever's sharpshooting skills were still as sharp as when he was eight years old. 
Nidever spent his last years in his home on Nidever Hill, the current site of the child's estate, Santa Barbara Zoo, where he died in 1883. The young man from Tennessee, an accomplished marksman, adventurer, trapper, hunter, Indian fighter, Pierre's whole fighter slash survivor, explorer, history changer, re the Alutes, rancher, real estate mogul, skipper, island surveyor, patriot, gold miner, Santa Barbara grizzly bear hunter, having killed over 200, discoverer of the lost woman, and man of courage as honored in a ballad. What major monument was erected for this Santa Barbara leading citizen? None. In fact, for such a legendary figure, it was surprising to learn that Nidever's final resting place had been a mystery for decades. Paraphrasing the Santa Barbara Independent, that changed when Santa Barbara history buff Alex Griswacki did some investigating and located the graves of Nidever, his wife, and his children at Calvary Cemetery on Hope Avenue in Santa Barbara. As graves registration officer for the Sons of Union veterans of the Civil War, Griswacki knows how to find dead people. After searching mission records, he found the lost rites had been recorded, but there had been no burial location noted. So Griswacki decided to search out Sanchez's grave, which was also unknown at the time. He determined that after Nidever's death, she moved to a property on Lower Santa Barbara Street, which still stands today. She died on August 12, 1892, and was buried at the Catholic Cemetery. At the time, the Catholic burial ground was the Siena Guides Cemetery, located on Hollister Avenue. It was abandoned in 1895 and some family members slowly began moving their relatives' remains to other cemeteries as it fell into disrepair. After some detective work, Griswacki found the original burial map of Calvary Cemetery and saw that the Nidever's daughter, Isabel Beale, had purchased the plot there for $1 in 1900. Listed on the map were the burials of Jacob and Marcus Nidever, and a later notation that said, the remains of Mr. and Mrs. Nidever. He then also found George Nidever's burial card, which he assumed must indicate a transfer. Putting all the evidence together, Griswacki believes that Nidever, when he died, was buried near his adobe on Nidever Hill. Then when the property sold, Nidever was moved by Isabel Beale, his daughter, to the Siena Guida Cemetery, where he was at some point joined with his wife's remains. And then after burying her brother, Marcus, at the Calvary Cemetery, Isabel Beale moved her parents away from the crumbling Siena Guidas to be with the rest of the family. Today, Beale is also buried near her parents, as are three of her siblings. Alex, thanks for all your hard work and effort that resulted in a proper recognition of George and Maria Nidever. Great job, Alex. Finally, George Nidever was immortalized in the ballad which so impressed Ralph Waldo Emerson that he supplemented his essay, Courage, from his Society and Solitude with a transcription of its lyrics. Emerson states, I am permitted to enrich my chapter 
by adding an anecdote of pure courage from real life as narrated in a ballad by a lady to whom all the particulars of the fact are exactly known." End quote. Thank you.